So up next is uh, Chris Byron, coming from the uh, University of Florida, Gainesville. And um, Chris finished up his freshman year as part of the RU program. And uh, he came in here interested in quantum information theory. And I suggested this uh, project connecting um, time travel to something practical. So, and, you know, it sounded completely crackpot <laughs> at the beginning, but I think you're convinced now that it's not crackpot. Okay. So, um, great. Uh, take it away. All right. So, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mark and Vishal for helping me out here. Very thankful to be here as part of this REU. All right. So, uh, my, my project deals with closed timeline curves as a method for practical state discrimination. So, it is a fundamental result of quantum mechanics that quantum states are non-orthogonal, cannot be distinguished perfectly. Uh, closed timeline curves, however, are an object study in general relativity uh, with many interesting applications to quantum information theory, one of them being that you can distinguish non-orthogonal quantum states perfectly. Moreover, you can use quantum circuits to simulate CTCs and you can combine the simulation of these CTCs with state discrimination schemes for CTCs to practically discriminate non-orthogonal quantum states. All right, so some background on state discrimination. Pro the problem with state discrimination can be phrased like this. So Alice has a set of non-orthogonal states. She picks a state rho k from that set with a certain probability. She sends it to Bob. Bob knows the set of states that she's using, and she knows the prob he knows the, prob the probability distribution that she's using. So the question is, how can Bob guess the state that he was sent? So you can represent this uh, state discrimination with the following diagram. Alice picks the state according to this preparation machine here. She sends it to Bob. Bob uses a set of n measurement operators to determine the state that he was sent. So that means he should have n possible measurement outcomes. If he measures the outcome i, or if he gets the measurement outcome i, then he guesses that Alice sent him the state rho i. So this provides a convenient method of quantifying the probability of error. In other words, the probability that his guess was wrong. In general, for non-orthogonal states, our probability of error will always be greater than zero. So the many state discrimination schemes will rely on using multiple copies of the input state, the one state that Bob was sent. Uh, and this will in general enhance the probability of success. Um, and so suppose we have n copies of the input state. The best possible measurement that Bob can perform is a collective measurement, that is simultaneously measuring all n states at the same time. The optimal probability of error will decrease exponentially with the number of copies that Bob has, and it's quantified by that error exponent there, psi. So the multiple quantum Chernoff bound basically gives a uh, analytical form to that error exponent, psi, in terms of the input states there. And this is useful for uh, studying our circuit later on. All right, so as I said before, closed timeline curves are objects studied in general relativity. Uh, you can think of them as world lines that end where they begin. Uh, in other words, they're closed curves in space time. So in this way, you can traverse a set of x, y, z, t coordinates when you're going along the world line and then when you come back to the initial point, you're going to have the same x, y, z, t coordinates as where you entered the CTC. So the Deutschian model of CTCs basically describes quantum mechanics near CTCs. He strips away all the general relativistic details of CTCs and just simply represents a closed timeline curve as a unitary interaction between a state obeying, obeying normal chronology and a state traveling along a closed timeline curve, a chronology violating system. And he imposes a self-consistency condition that the state that enters the 
CTC must be the state that emerges in the CTC. So to make this a little bit more concrete, let's uh, talk about an example here. The top system here is a system that obeys normal chronology here. The bottom system here is a state that tr is traveling along the closed timeline curve. The double bars here on the left represent the past mouth of the wormhole, in other words, where the state emerges from the past. And the double bars on the right there represent where the state goes into the future. And you can think of the CTC state traveling in a sort of time loop on the bottom line there. So in this case, the unitary interaction between these two states is a swap gate and a controlled Hadamard gate. And th this particular uh, circuit can be used to distinguish the input states zero and minus. Uh, if you if there's, there's a laser pointer you can use oh. if you want to build that. Yeah. That's nice. So you can show that if your input state is zero here for psi, the only state, CTC state, that will satisfy the self consistency in the condition is zero which means that you're guaranteed to measure zero here. And the same thing for the minus state. So you have if essentially you can affect this sort of mapping here between your input state here and the state that you measure there. So that's a practical method, not a practical method, but a method for a state discrimination using a closed timeline curve. All right, so that's nice. So, so maybe you should emphasize that that violates the uncertainty it violates the uncertainty principle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. So how is that possible? It's because of the self-consistency condition there. So the fact that the, input, the state that enters the CTC must be the, state, the same as the state that en exits the CTC uh, means that the CTC acts as a sort of a non-linear channel for the, the quantum state. And, it, and uh, quantum operations in ordinary quantum mechanics are linear. However, because we have this nonlinear operation here, we can sort of bend uh, the laws of quantum mechanics and achieve perfect state discrimination here. All right, so how can we make this actually happen? Well, we want a circuit that can simulate a CTC and then I'll map it, a random input state here, psi k, onto a unique state that we measure. So in this case, we studied the following circuit. So just to describe what's going on here, uh, you can think of it as the following recipe repeated multiple times. You take the input state that you want to discriminate here, you interact it unitarily with a so-called CTC state, you pass on the result from the CTC's channel onto another unitary interaction and just repeat the procedure n times. So for this procedure, of course, you're going to need n copies of the input state, rho s. Uh, you're going to measure rho c n for n copies. That's going to be your output state. And your, what about your initial CTC state? Well, that, that can be any arbitrary state, actually. Uh, and we'll show that this circuit makes that arbitrary initial state converge to a unique output state, which can be used to, for state discrimination. So some interesting questions are, what's the analytical probability of error using our state discrimination scheme? Uh, how does the probability of error behave asymptotically for large n? Uh, how does it compare to the Chernoff bound? And how can we optimize this circuit in terms of the unitaries we use and the initial CTC state? All right, so say we take n iterations of that recipe I mentioned earlier in that circuit. The probability that we measure outcome k after the nth iteration is going to depend on the probability that we measure a particular outcome for the previous iteration so for the way that we define our unitaries, it can be uh, written as the following summation here. Note that the first factor here simply describes the probability that we measure an outcome j on the previous iteration. And the second factor here denotes uh, the probability we measure k 
given we measure j on the previous iteration. So speaking loosely, this forms a Markov chain because your statistics for a particular iteration of that circuit are only dependent on the statistics for the previous iteration of that circuit. So you can think of uh, the basis states as forming a Markov chain and to find the probability of uh, error for our circuit, we can just simply sum probabilities over these Markov chains. It's by no means rigorous proof, but sort of a argu uh, heuristic argument. So a convenient strategy is to gather up all the probabilities of transitioning from one basis state to another basis state into a probability transition matrix here. And using that, that probability transition matrix, we can use Markov theory to derive some neat results. So the first result is that we can write the probability of success, or one minus the probability of error, in terms of this Markov transition matrix. Uh, Markov theory says that for our particular types of Markov chains, this quantity here will approach one as the number of copies of the input state approaches infinity. So this basically proves that our circuit will converge to a unique basis state uh, that is produced as a uh, product of the mapping of the input states. All right, so there's some degrees of freedom in our state discrimination circuit. One degree of freedom is what do we set our initial CTC state to, because that can be any arbitrary state. Well, you can use that uh, transition matrix to expand the probability of success in terms of the following summations here. And you end up th with this following expression here. Uh, note that the first factor here is simply the probability that we measure an outcome i for the initial CTC state. And the second factor there is the probability of success given we measure that outcome i. So the probability that we measure outcome i for the initial CTC state, those probabilities must add up to one. So you can consider them, this expression here, as a weighted average of the probabilities of success. Um, so in that case, you can use a simple convexity argument to argue that the best possible initial CTC state we can uh, use in our circuit is just a simple basis state from an orthonormal basis. And that's something you can calculate, what would be the optimal one? Yes. And, and then does it depend on n, the number of copies? It does. Okay. So it could change if n right. gets larger. Because this quantity here, probability of success, giving a measure of the outcome i for the initial CTC state, changes with n. Mm -hmm. So to determine the initial CTC state using this equation here, we're going to need uh, its going to end up being dependent on n. All right, so an interesting question is, what's the asymptotic behavior of our uh, circuit? And this often comes up in state discrimination analysis. So a basic outline of the argument to derive the asymptotic behavior is this. You, cal you calculate the second largest eigenvalues of all the transition matrices. You take mu m and say that's the largest of all those second largest eigenvalues. And using some uh, linear algebra, you can show that the probability of error, given that we have n copies, is approximately equal to the largest, second largest eigenvalue to the nth power. And then we can uh, use the what's called the Perron-Frobenius theorem 
place a bound on this largest of the second largest eigenvalues, mu m here. I should mention that using the results of one of Mark's papers, I think he might discuss this uh, after me, uh, you can use, uh, you can optimize these bounds here using a semi-definite program. Essentially, you're just maximizing or minimizing this quantity here over a particular channel. So we know that for a large n, our probability of error is going to decay with the number of copies of uh, the input state here. It's going to decay with an error exponent psi. Now, an interesting question is, how does our psi compare to the optimal psi? The optimal psi, as I said before, is given by the quantum Chernoff bound. And using the bounds that we derived for the mu m quantity here, we can represent the our error exponent in terms of the unitaries acting in our circuit. Uh, one of the particular input states here, and uh, as a minimization or maximization procedure. So the the, the key takeaway here is that. The, the interval within which our uh, error exponent lies um, may contain the optimal error exponent, the Chernoff bound, in other words. So it would seem possible to achieve the Chernoff bound in this case. And in fact, for some simple cases, we do achieve the Chernoff bound. So this is a, a plot of the probability of error using our state discrimination circuit compared to the number of copies of the input state we have for uh, the two input states, zero and minus. In other words, the B92 QKD states. So the green curve here represents the analytically calculated error probability curve here. The red curve here represents uh, the optimal probability curve. And you can see that for finite n, the optimal strategy is going to be better than our CPC strategy here. But you can also show analytically that in the limit of a large n, we achieve the Chernoff bound. In other words, the optimal strategy has no advantage over our strategy. And this is a nice result. However, this is not necessarily the best possible case because there exist some strategies that use multiple copies of input states. Uh, that can actually achieve the optimal probability of error for finite n. Although in this case, you know, you're using relatively few copies, so practically it doesn't, the difference doesn't matter in our case. Sorry, so um, just to clarify, you might have said the, the red is the optimal? Yes. From the Chernoff, and then yes. the green is what we get. Yeah, and the, the points here are uh, from a numerical simulation of our circuit and the solid green line is an analytically calculated curve. All right, so to summarize this all, uh, we basically proposed an, a new, or provided a uh, new state discrimination strategy that was inspired by closed timeline curves. Uh, and then we study it analytically and derive some convenient results in terms of Markov theory. And we find that in some cases, our strategy <coughs> for state discrimination <coughs> is going to be competitive with the optimal measurement. This is rather nice because our strategy only requires that we use fixed measurements on the output state and that we use a fixed set of unitaries. Whereas other state discrimination strategies that use multiple copies of the input state are more sophisticated. In other words, they use many different measurements 
or many different unitaries that depend on uh, previous results. So if we can be competitive with these state discrimination strategies while using our simple procedure, that's pretty good. And furthermore, our approach is very general. Uh, most of the other state discrimination strategies out there uh, are designed for particular cases, like say two qubit states, or distinguishing symmetric quantum states, whereas our approach is completely general in that we can discriminate an arbitrary number of states, arbitrary number of dimensions. And so that's, so combining all these advantages here, we could potentially have a very nice uh, uh, method for practical state discrimination. Um, so some future uh, directions would be to compare it with uh, some more alternate uh, state discrimination strategies. Um, we've begun to do that numerically, but progress is still being made. Um, and then another potential direction is to consider applications of our state discrimination strategy. Uh, for example, in, in principle, uh, we could use our state discrimination strategy to distinguish coherent optical states. Um, this has to do with the fact that uh, coherent optical states will have a certain overlap. So if you can find some sort of uh, logical qubit states, we could uh, potentially simulate uh, distinguishing co uh, coherent optical states. All right. um, is there any questions? Well, let's thank yeah. Chris. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I, um, this is cool. Uh, what am I? What am I to make of you know the closed timeline curve? You know, um, just at the very beginning of the talk, we have. I have. Uh, maybe you could pass. Go back to like slide number two or something where we sure. have those little two vertical bars representing like a time loop or something. There, yeah, that guy. Yeah. So, you know, I, I assume that the row CCC to the right loops back around and comes back and goes into the row CCC on the left. You, you, using the quantum computing model, that's right. Okay. Uh, so, so, and then psi exists in like regular time. Like yeah. Just going. So, basically, I'm supposed to think of, you know, starting at time t on the left, psi is just sort of sitting there, maybe passing through some circuit, and like, you know, all of a sudden, some row CTC comes out of a wormhole that's effectively already cloned Psi in some sort of sense, because it's gone through this thing infinitely many times. But it's just in the world of Psi, all I see is this thing comes out of a wormhole, and it's a state that kind of is a lot closer to what I am than it should be, based on if it had just gone through this one and then I go through this gate, and like maybe since it's gone through it infinitely many times already. Yeah, the that, that, that's like correct. The row CTC is just the identity. Yeah. So, okay, it's uh, you could kind of think of it this way. Um, it would almost seem that row CTC knows that it's going to be eventually affect the measurement here. Mm -hmm. So that means in the when it emerges from the CTC here. It initializes itself to a state that will satisfy the uh, uh, self-consistency condition. And so it's the same state going in as it is coming yeah. in. It's, yeah. So so it, it's like an I in vector would be a distinct vector. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. Um, the the CTC state actually can be represented as an eigen vector of that Markov transition matrix. I just got it. But you know, the way I imagine this is like, you know, the first time through the matrix, it wasn't in that state. It was in some other state. And it just sort of, we went through this time loop in, you know, a thousand times, and it got closer and closer and closer. In the simulation, the that's right. Yeah. In the simulation, uh, the initial CTC state here mm -hmm. really has nothing to do with CTC state from a true CTC. 
is just simply that if we apply this recipe of the unitary interaction enough times and we take the output, the final output from that unitary interaction, it will be the CTC state from a true CTC interaction using that same unitary. According to Deutsch's model. Yeah, the really model. True yeah, there, there's uh, <laughs> several uh, different different models for CTC. No, standard laboratory CTC. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So can you clone things with this? You, you can actually. Okay. Seems like. I might have a few comments. Yeah. Maybe go back to the previous slide. Okay. So. Deutsch's modification to quantum mechanics was to impose this self-consistency condition, mm -hmm. right? And he did that to avoid these grandfather paradoxes that can occur with CTCs, like if you go back in time and kill your grandfather, and then how do you address them in the first place? In fact, I told that to my grandfather when, when he was still alive, and he was very upset about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so it might seem, it might seem harmless but the effect is to, to introduce a drastic nonlinear modification of quantum mechanics, right? Where all these weird things happen, where, where all these weird things are possible if a CTC were to behave like this. Um, so a lot of people since Deutsch's work have questioned whether that, that's a good uh, model of a CTC for, for various reasons other than what I'm saying here. Um, but, but what we're finding here is that uh, at least this idea can be put to, to use. Mm -hmm. you know, because what happens mathematically is that the state of the CTC is a fixed point of this evolution. Right? So there's a channel that's induced by the unitary interaction and a partial trace over this. And the C mathematically, the CTC state is, is simply a fixed point. Right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the circuit on the next slide uh, gives the convergence to the fixed point in practical quantum mechanics and what you can do in a laboratory. Yeah, yeah, right. And I mean, you said something about Markov's change. It seems almost like classic probability or something. Right? I don't know if that's yeah, yeah. Was, um, but like, in, in a sense, you could use this uh, circuit here uh, to simulate a classical random walk uh -huh. by just measuring the outcome after uh, each iteration. So the, the classical Markov chain structure comes about because of the particular unitary interaction that we choose. Okay. Um, if you go back to the previous slide, you see it's a swap. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. So you see it's a swap and then a controlled unitary, mm -hmm. right? And the control is with respect to a particular basis. And then that structure is what induces uh, this Markov chain structure because when you do a partial trace with respect to this controlled unitary, that's like a measurement of that qubit with respect to the basis for the control qubit. And so that's why that emerges. And so it, it could be, so this is another topic for future work, that um, you know, it's known like with, with quantum random walks, you get generic square root speed ups. And that's something we're not taking advantage of. You know, we're sort of using a classical Markov chain structure that emerges from this choice of unitary. And so it could be that there, if you go to the next slide, um, that there might be some clever quantum post processing of this unitary that there would get an even faster convergence. We, we don't know. But, um, yeah, it seems like you could maybe like entangle all your copies of OS together and just get them in your browser. Oh, but the, the, the problem for state discrimination is you assume you have multiple tensor product copies of a given state. Mm -hmm. And so that's an assumption of state discrimination. Um, no, it's also like necessary to, to have the same uh, channel at each iteration such that you're converging to a fixed point. So I just, it, it was funny the way you prefaced the talk. It's like, you know, at first it seemed crackpot, but then when we worked on it, it seemed like we got something useful. That was sort of my experience reading the abstract. Oh. It's like the first <laughs> sentence close kind of like curves and get to a practical scheme by the last few sentences. So, yeah. Any other questions?